Thank you. Thank you very much. You see, the subject that we are discussing is geopolitics in South Asia and its impact on India's security. Now, geopolitics is geography and political events, how they are impacting. Let me start with a very basic thing. Uh, there is something called defense and there is something called security. Now, what is defense? Defense basically means that your own territory is secure. And security basically means that after your territory, territorial integrity is assured, then you move out helping the other countries because you are a military power. So you look for a risen status. You are, then the people respect you. It is something like if your home is not secure in the colony that you are living, there is the other people will not have too much confidence in you. And similar is for the nations that they will actually trust you and pay you deference. It will not happen. So the basic principle is that the home base must be secure before you do any naval operations because that is security. That is not the primary task of the Navy. The primary task of the three services is to ensure the territorial integrity of India. Having said that, now what are we talking about? We are a country unknown to or not caring. Not many people in this country care to really realize whose territorial integrity is under attack. So we are talking defense. The main thing, your home base is not secure. We have two military lines. We have one line with Pakistan, the line of control, and we have another line with China. With China, the line came into being not in 1962, but in 1993. 1993. So we have uh, two military lines now. And we as analysts and as a government and as a media, we are very prone to dissing Pakistan. The fact of the matter is that Pakistan is not deterred. Pakistan is not stopping infiltration. So Pakistan, despite the fact that it has half the army, it does not have so much of an air force, it is unable to, uh, it doesn't listen to us and we are unable to do anything about it. This is a fact. So whatever we are doing, we are doing within our own borders. We are not being able to stop them from doing what they are doing. So the point I'm making is obviously there is something wrong somewhere. Now on top of that, we have China, which in April, May 2013, without firing a shot, they actually shift the line of control, line of actual control to their advantage in Ladakh. And both the Manmohan Singh government and now the Mo Modi government, and this is the issue that came up in the recent 18th round of talks, border talks, we have mutually accepted the new line of actual control. This is called military coercion. And this will be the language of military power in this century. This is the future of military power. That means we have a problem now. Despite that, how many people have really bothered to question this basic thing that our military people, especially our army generals keep saying, right from the first time in 2009 when General Deepak Kapoor publicly said that we have to prepare for a two-front war. Now my point is when individually these countries are not getting debtors, shouldn't we be scratching our heads and saying, hey guys, something is wrong, this is baloney. How do you take on two formidable adversaries? Pakistan is not a normal military power, please understand. Traditionally, the war was fought in three domains. That was on land, in air, and at sea, which is what we do. The Indian military is supposed to do. Today, China has expertise to fight in five domains. They fight, they can fight on land, air, sea, space, cyber. And Pakistan has the capability to fight on two war fields at the same time. They, can, they are the only country par in the world 
which today has built up an expertise which they first tested during the Kargil War of 1999. And today they have expertise to fight simultaneously a conventional war as well as a non-conventional war. This terrorism that which they call is their first line of offense. Now why I'm telling you all this, it's a big subject. The simple point that I am making, making here is that somebody has to stand up and question instead of saying that, look, we are spending 1.7% of our GDP on defense. And there are analysts who say, please make it 3% of the GDP. I say, you make it 10% of the GDP. The fact of the matter is, your present policy of having two strong strategic players who are non non-status quo nations and who are in cahoots with one another, you have not been able to take them on. And if you are unable to take them on, my dear sir, you can have any policies, you can have a act east policy, a act west policy, a act middle east policy, you can talk anything. The fact of the matter is the smaller nations will always hold China in awe and they will never have that sort of a deference for you as a nation. This is a fact of life. So this needs to be corrected. Now why this needs to be corrected is because if you will not correct this, it will affect your rise. Why it will affect your rise is because we believe, or traditionally it is thought, that diplomacy is only about your economic power. If you have the money, if your economy is doing well, your diplomacy everybody will listen to. No, diplomacy stands on two legs. It is economic power and it is military power. And especially in the part of the world where you have disturbed military lines, you have live, live lines. It is very much about military power. So this is something which is completely ignored. So here is there, here are two things that I have to say, uh, given the time that I have. The first thing is, please start questioning as a people, as a people who give money to the defense that this whole thing of about two front war is complete nonsense. What we need to do, and that is the only way to do it, I'm leaving you with a thought. You have to balance one power and you have to make some mutual adjustments with another power. Please think right from Nehru's time, it was our first prime minister who said that Pakistan is our threat, China is okay. How is it that after that, any, any major part, they, re, they review their doctrines, they review their thinking. In our case, even today, it is the same. And it has not worked. Now, the effect of that on the economy is rather simple. Because I, as part of my job, I also cover the defense industry. Now, defense industry is a very clear indicator of what is going on. You see, the point is that the present government has been in power now, they've been there since May last year. We have just finished with Aero India in Bangalore. Believe you me, the foreign investors, the foreign uh, companies, their presence was minimal. Because they are still worried, they are wondering what sort of policy changes will come. I mean, we all are happy about Make in India. But the point is to Make in India, you have to do certain things. To begin with, you have to give out a very clear-cut policy. The guy wants to know what sort of FDI will you permit. The guy wants to know will he have some sort of a share in the management or not. I mean, what is happening today with Deso, who is trying to sell these 126 aircraft? Very simple thing, where are they stuck? They are stuck because they will not take assurance for what is our premier aeronautic agency, HAL. They are refusing because they know how can I take assurance for their timelines and how can I hold the cost? It is not possible for me. So this is why we are stuck with that. Now, coming to a bit on the Navy. You see, uh, i just take one more minute. You see, we have three services. A quick background before I say what I say. Uh, we have something called force levels. Primarily what that means is that, all right, the army has a lot of manpower, so army is structured around manpower. So we say this is the force level of the army. For the other two services, the manpowers are less. They are equipment intensive, both the Air Force and the Navy. So we say, all right, 
their force levels are around equipment. Now, the equipment of the Navy and the Air Force are so expensive that you cannot flog them on tasks where they are sub-optimally utilized. For example, after 26-11, we had the November 2008 attacks. After that, what was the Coast Guard's job to do the coastal duty? It is the Navy which has taken on the overall responsibility. You can please go and check with the Naval, Western Naval Command. Their premier ships, they are being flogged today on the coastal defense. And how do you defend, how do you do surveillance of such a massive coast to coastline? Take the case of anti-piracy. It is very good we are doing a good job. Plus, please think this is not your primary job because when you go on an anti-piracy operation, you are taking a ship, a ship which is so expensive, you are switching off the radars. Because they're not required, you're not doing any war training there. You're just going round in circles. That is all that you're doing. So this is all at the expense of the war training that you should be doing. Quickly about the army. This is something I must say with you because for me, this is a personal crusade. And what is this crusade? Since 1990, the Indian army has been doing CI ops. Since 1990, the Pakistan army has got more and more emboldened. They continue, they keep sending these guys. Why? Because as far as the Pakistan army is concerned, please, this is how it runs. You have the army chief, you have the guy who's in charge of the military operations. He only makes the war plans. Then you have a ISI chief who is in charge of the irregular warfare. He sends all these jokers into our territory. In our case, our main man, the DGMO, who is in charge of military operations, instead of looking at the war plan, the guy is harassed because he has to give the state of how many terrorists killed, what has happened, what is going on. So today the situation is that that, and we made a fence also, we have put up a fence all along the line of actual control, a line of control with Pakistan. So because of that fence, what is happening is those Pakis, they are quite happy because they know that these guys are not attacking us, nothing will happen. And they are doing their CI ops, wherever they are doing, they are involved in Afghanistan. Whereas what the Indian Army today is doing is, we are sacrificing. This is, I mean, it is, I, it saddens me because I wore uniform for 13 years. But that was just about the time I left the Army when uh, this whole thing started in 1990. You see, it saddens me that young officers are getting uh, martyred every day, but they're not dying on the line of control. I'm sorry, they're not dying on their primary task. I'm sorry, if you're doing this task that you are doing, you have to pay a cost. And what is the cost? The cost is war preparedness. General V.K. Singh said in 2012 that army is not fit for war. Everybody knows that. And after that, all chiefs said, now, if the army is not fit for the primary job, how can the foreign investor come and put money here. He will always be about it. We can keep talking and eulogizing our army and our armed forces. We are big and Pakistan's, they, you know, they are like this, but they're not. This is the truth. So I think I'll stop because otherwise I'll get ticked off. Thank you.